southern France is well known for its impressive Qatar castles. There are many of them and their sheer size and also super strong walls are quite remarkable. But why are they in such a deplorable state now? Who and why would destroy such nice buildings instead of using them? And why were the Qatars mercilessly killed, hundreds of them even burned alive? A simple explanation for the annihilation of the Qatars is given in the history textbooks so that people don't ask too many questions. They were simply declared to be heretics, meaning people holding beliefs radically different from the rest of the society, and so it would look normal that they would be uh, brutally killed. Many researchers, though, even mainstream researchers, uh, upon delving in the matter, they simply find out that uh, Qatarism was not a heresy in any way. It was simply and solely a branch of the Orthodox Christian Church. Regardless of exactly which church it was a branch of, the main point is that it wasn't any sort of heresy. And here's why. For example, Cathars had their own specific cross. As you can see, its points are somewhat thicker, and it's also placed inside a circle. Bearing that in mind, let's visit Notre Dame de Paris. Not only one of the main Christian temples of Paris itself, but also one of the most important in the whole of France. Cathar crosses are all over the cathedral. This one in particular is above the main entry, and this is the main scene depicting the Last Judgment. Clearly, the main figure is depicted with a Cathar cross on his head, a style of depiction which is standard for Orthodox icons. If indeed Catharism was a heresy, then why would they literally fill up their mainstream Christianity cathedral with heretic symbols? Moreover, mainstream historians themselves assure us that Notre Dame de Paris was born in the 13th century, and that is exactly the time when, supposedly, the Catholic Church, the Pope's, organized special crusades for a total annihilation of the Cathars. So, we are to believe that while sending armies to erase them from the face of the earth, at the same time the Catholic Christians were adorning their most important cathedrals with Cathar crosses? The stories that the textbooks tell about the Cathars don't really jibe with reality. First of all, what was the real reason for killing them? They were not really heretics as it has become obvious. So that was not the real reason. And second of all, when exactly did it happen? Let's visit the museum uh, Paul Dupuis in Toulouse. They have a collection of Qatar crosses over there. And interestingly enough, even the mainstream uh, archaeologists over there uh, have dated them at 14th and 15th century, as it is written on the tag next to them. But according to the artificially created and non-realistic Scaligerian history, at that time the Qatars should have been already dead completely, all of them destroyed. How come their 
crosses are still around. Well, to avoid that uncomfortable moment, they have labeled them as stellis discoidalis or uh, disc shaped. Uh, you know, stellos uh, stones. It's true that these are stones uh, shaped as uh, discs, but why don't they just uh, write the truth that these are Qatar crosses and nothing else? And absolutely the same crosses dating at absolutely same periods can be seen in the museums of Eastern Europe where they show the Orthodox crosses of that time. And not only the crosses, most importantly, the Qatar, the huge uh, Qatar castles were thriving and flourishing and were mentioned very regularly all over the historic records of uh, those reaching uh, 16th and even 17th century. But the Qatars were supposedly dead already in 13th century. How come? It seems that the annihilation of the Qatars, along with many other events that were unpalatable for the history fabricators to just get rid of them and not to attract uh, unnecessary attention to them, they were just pushed back in time. Before reviewing why exactly were the cutters uncomfortable, let's see what kind of uh, explanation did uh, the Scaligarian followers cook to explain the numerous references to the flourishing Qatar castles up to the 17th century. So the story they are telling us is as follows. Yes, the Qatar castles uh, were uh, destroyed in 13th century during the specially organized crusades against the Qatars, but we find later references to them because some local people, local noble people restored them after they got demolished and used them and although it is written Qatar castles, there were no Qatars in them as such. And then the penguins continue, the modern followers of Scaliger. And now we see the castles laying in ruins again because they were destroyed for the second time in the 17th century when all these noble people became poor and could no longer afford to maintain them and that's why they ordered their demolition. Really, all these independent noble people who got hold of them, none of them thought to keep them until they acquire money or leave them as a heritage for their children and grandchildren. And also if they couldn't afford to pay their servants anymore, they how did they find money to pay somebody to demolish these buildings, which by the way are very very strong. The walls are over a meter thick and even special cement was used in these walls, much stronger than our modern cement. And some of these castles are rather huge, they're like entire small towns. Actually the demolition of all these castles is such a hard work by itself that it is really a very interesting question. Why? would one even do that for any reason? And actually, looking at the overall condition of the castles now and at their very thick and strong walls, the chances that all this got demolished manually would be less. Probably explosions would have been needed to bring down these mighty buildings. Mainstream historians assure us uh, that uh, there were no serious uh, explosion uh, military uh, techniques familiar in Europe at uh, that time, the 13th century. I'm not saying that's true, I'm just telling how their own stories don't match. If you feel that I'm exaggerating and that motivated armies or paid peasants would destroy anything manually, try demolishing over a meter thick wall made of strong beton with hammer. And I'm really talking from experience because the building, the house where I live, 
parts of it are some 500 years old. It's not, it wasn't even a fortification, just a normal house at that time, a bakery. The walls are, let's say, one meter thick. So a couple of years ago, we decided to change one of the windows because it was too small. We removed the old window and we had a big new window. We would have never thought that it would be a problem to remove, let's say, half of a square meter of wall. But it was impossible, although we had even these tools for breaking beton. They were barely making any scars to this. Um, it's, it's stones mixed with something harder than beton, actually. We worked couple of days on it and all we could do is remove just a couple of stones. The tools broke but the stones were not moving. Eventually we had to look to hire some sort of very specialized equipment and because it was my bedroom I slept in open air looking at the sky directly for a couple of months until we could complete this very simple project of removing a bit of the wall. And the men who saw this, all of them said, this mixture is harder than beton. And in the case of the Qatar castles, we are talking about destroying entire villages or small towns made of this material. And yet a couple of the castles, the penguins assure us, okay, they did not get destroyed by their poor owners. They just fell apart by themselves. Now this is uh, what is left of the Perpetuse castle. Barely anything is still standing and uh, this one, we are being assured, just fell apart by itself on its own. Nobody destroyed it. Just like that, within a two, three hundred years, fell apart on its own. I mean, most of the buildings are completely blown away and missing in this castle, and they are assuring it that, that it fell peacefully apart so quickly. And all these strange uh, metamorphoses are happening only to Qatar castles in France. All the other castles, even if they are not so strong uh, built, they stay much longer and they don't get destroyed and rebuilt regularly. But it's it just a chance, the Qatar castles, it just happens to them. And why do they publish all these ridiculous stories as history? Just to cover up that the Qatars were mercilessly murdered and exterminated somewhere in the 17th century. And their castles, which were the main trade points, where all the riches of France were concentrated at that time, they were fully functional until the 17th century. And that's why they were, they were regularly mentioned in all the documents of that time. And that was the first and only demolition of the castles. But what about the written records of the Qatars themselves? Maybe they will shed light on what actually happened and uh, on who were the Qatars as such, because that we don't know as well. Well, all such records are conveniently missing. They were fed to the fires together with the Qatar themselves and this particular image, the very top uh, figure, even shows who was overseeing everything. The Cathars were also known as Bogomil Cathars because the type of Christianity that they were following came from somewhere in the East, and its proponent was Pop Bogomil. His name translated means priest, dear to God. Well, most probably they are a type of Christianity of which we know very little was much nearer to the original teachings of Christ because, wherever they went, they organized the social life of themselves and those who followed them. 
They were all equal, lived in harmony with nature. Taxes were very low or non-existent, and there were no violent conflicts between the various groups in the society. That seems fundamentally more Christian to me than the activities of the so-called real Christians that were burning and torturing and so on, which seems to me to be inspired by some other god, not the god of Jesus Christ, but the one with two horns on his head. The original founders of the Katara culture uh, were also known as Volgars, and uh, in areas of uh, Italy, France, and Spain, uh, where their culture was flourishing till date, the local people would be called uh, Volgars, Vulgars, or Bulgars, or something like that. Uh, tribes, or let's say groups of uh, people with similar names, can be found at various places in uh, Asia and uh, Balkans till now. Apparently, these uh, Vulgars they went and uh, spread and lived in different places. Uh, there is a Tibetan tribe uh, called uh, Bulgars, a full country is still named after them, Bulgaria. And the name itself, Volgars, comes from the river Volga because they came from that region. But it wasn't uh, just uh, them. They mixed with the local population and uh, this uh, symbiosis eventually formed the unique and uh, probably very uh, nice Qatar culture because they were extremely peaceful people, they were uh, famous for having still magical powers, they were vegetarians, men and women had equal position in society. And uh, most importantly, the local legends in various locations where the Qatars used to live, they all say that they used a lot of white magic in their daily lives. They preserved that knowledge, the legends say, from the really old times. And also because uh, the picture that mainstream historians are drawing for us uh, of the Qatars, the way they are presenting it is, uh, frankly speaking, quite perverted. For example, when they read these types of things in the mainstream history books, that the Cathars were against sex, presented in a very unattractive way so that they kind of were against sex, or taught that it is something bad. Well, the reality of not only Cathars, I don't know about them in particular, but all these Gnostic religions are on purpose presented in the misleading light to us, so that we don't always understand them, and therefore we don't benefit from their wisdom. When an average person nowadays hears that a certain philosophy considers sex to be bad, one will feel a natural aversion to such a strange philosophy. Because for the common person on the street, sex is the most pure and beautiful experience that they can have in life at all. And hating it is very weird and unnatural. And that's absolutely true. What is not true is that the Gnostics actually hated it. They simply had access to higher planes in which higher types of ecstasy could be experienced. And that is why those who would have achieved those higher levels already, after using genuine spiritual practices as taught by Jesus Christ originally, and now completely lost because of the church, one may eventually become less interested in sex. 
in the same way as when people grow up, they, in a natural way, lose interest towards children's toys. That in no way means that they will start hating the toys, or that they would never play with toys even as adults. But because the parasites don't want the humans to have any access to the higher levels of consciousness and the higher levels of ecstasy, that's why they have compiled all these books of lies about Gnosticism. Or another example of how they are distorting our ideas, correct ideas about the world. Let's say somebody does something selflessly helping the society and helping the other people around. And so we are told that such a person aband abandoned his own interest for the sake of the interest of others and as if acted against his own good. But from a Gnostic point of view, it is a completely different picture, quite the opposite. By the power of genuine spiritual practices, one can reach such a level of understanding the nature of one's true self that one can directly perceive that all beings are connected in one huge, one single consciousness. And when he acts, for the benefit of others, he sees clearly how this benefits him as well, because he is part of this one single organism. Person with such vision will never go to war or commit the violence, because he will feel as if he is hurting himself. And evil, which now rules the earth, doesn't want the people to have this vision, because then it won't be able to trick them into believing and doing stupid things like this. People are told to commit crimes, for example, in the name of some higher, allegedly good cause, like your country or something like that. And people buy it. They get drafted and they go to war and they commit horrible crimes. They can be tricked in such a way because they don't have the higher vision, the magical vision of the Qatars. And so, special Albigenesian crusade was organized by the popes in Rome, who of course could not tolerate the real teachings of Jesus Christ reaching the common people. But when the soldiers arrived on the spot to kill the Qatars, they found out that uh, it was no longer possible to make a difference of who is a real Qatar that has arrived from abroad and uh, who are the local people who have accepted their uh, beliefs and uh, lifestyle as well. There was no clear difference anymore, so they asked uh, uh, their leaders uh, how to discriminate between real Qatars that have to be killed and locals. Locals who were Catholic themselves. The answer of their leader was very easy to understand. Just kill everybody in line and God in heaven will after that sort out who is good and who is not. It is a very disturbing fact that the philosophy of kill the model and let God sort them out is so widely spread in a society. I mean, Christian people who consider themselves Christian wear these t-shirts. They are very popular. Thousands of them have sold, probably still selling. This type of philosophy is fundamentally so much not a Christian and against the message of Jesus Christ. This is a public advertising, a call for indiscriminate genocide. And as far as the Qatars, they were murdered in such a merciless way, just to exterminate this old knowledge of the peaceful white magic, which teaches man how to be the lord of one's environment. And that is why they worked so hard on destroying those huge, strong castles. 
they wouldn't risk any trace to be left of the Cathars, exactly like in the Bible. In the older times, when a certain deity with two horns on his head was instructing another tribe how to kill the people who had knowledge of the white magic, he was telling them, abandon the known rules of war, don't even kidnap their wives, don't even take their gold, burn everything. For example, the tragedy which happened to the Tibetan people. Why did it happen to them? Because they were relatively good keepers of the old knowledge. Until the 20th century, they kept the old medicine, they, called, they kept the old magical practices. And what happened to them? They were tortured and put in concentration camps. And the full world just watched and did nothing. Where are all these preposterous screamers depend, defending the so-called human rights? All that they are good for is to organize wars and get soldiers on the ground within a week based on a theoretical and hypothetical assumption that uh, something bad may happen if we don't go to this war. And when something very bad actually happens right in front of their eyes, they look the other way. Men who consider themselves Christians are part of military groups that have this as their emblem. These groups are financed by your money paid as taxes. Or maybe people should invest a bit more time in thinking before they vote. Or maybe we can find out more about the true philosophy of the Qatars from the information that has survived in the other places, for example, where Pop Bogomil himself lived. Ha! Huh, what a coincidence! What happened to the Bogomils over there as well is they were just murdered till the last one mercilessly. Why? They were uh, leading very secluded life in the mountains, avoiding uh, even meeting outsiders, what to speak of anything else. And yet, for some strange coincidence, they had to be killed till the last one, without any trace surviving about them or anything at all. It is also not by chance that this region of France is called Rossillon. It comes again from that word Rossianami, which means the scattered people, the way Mavro Urbini told us the survivors were called in old times. It cannot be a coincidence because the Qatars came from the Volga region, the original proponents of the teachings. They spoke this Slavic language in which the keepers of the old knowledge would identify themselves as Rasayanami. Actually, Rasayanami is the plural in this old Slavic language. The singular form uh, is Rasayan, which is even nearer to Rasilion, the French version. A monument has been erected nowadays in France commemorating the annihilation of the Qatars. And a very wise and appropriate uh, quote by Francis Bacon is placed under this monument. It says, Heretic is not the one who burns at the stake. He who lights the fire is the heretic. What Francis Bacon meant to say was that since heretic is somebody who is like strange, somebody who holds unusual or weird beliefs, 
So it is those who light up the fires to burn people alive. They are the strange ones. That's abnormal. That's not human. But as Anatoly Fomenko noted, there is uh, yet another meaning to this wise quote. Heretic is by definition a person, proponent of provocative beliefs that are in strong opposition to the general established belief in the society at given time. And that's exactly what the actual Reformation did not the one you hear about in school. The true reformation was about forcing upon the society with military power the new radically different and devilish way of life. According to a somewhat reliable channel material source, although they burned so many people who had magical knowledge alive in that time, they had to stop, they couldn't burn to their heart's content, so to say. And the reason was that since they were burning the actual saintly people, many of them would disappear and like dissolve into air as they were take, being taken to the stake. And the problem with that was that the common people, when they saw these miracles, they started actually realizing that saints were being burned. Most of the information in this uh, video is based on the New Chronology research, the New Chronology project of Anatoly Fomenko and Gleb Nusovsky. the central figure of the Qatar movement was born in Bulgaria and that's also where he was killed, erased from the face of earth together with all his followers. And in that very same country, Bulgaria, again its name comes from Bulgaria, the people from the Volga region, in that very same country, in recent times, one of the greatest modern prophets was born, the blind Saint Vanga. She departed from earth merely some two decades ago. So in modern Bulgaria, many people have hard lives due to the excessive government corruption. And since Vanga was a very famous saint, they would go to her and ask what have we done to deserve such unfair treatment, to deserve all this suffering? What kind of God has put us in such a situation that we are forced to live under constant oppression of this uh, criminal government? The answer they received was quite unexpected. She said, the nation had to pay for its sins because it's the Bulgarians, the other Bulgarians who allowed Pop Gumil to be murdered along with his followers in such a brutal way. That sounds quite abstract to most Bulgarians because uh, what they know about Pop Gumil is basically his name only. They are just a couple of lines in some remote page of the history textbook of their childhood. He is not treated as any major figure in our history, but now I understand that he actually was. And not just Bulgaria, but entire Europe as well, because the Bogomils 
or Cathars, they were the last stronghold of the true teachings, the genuine philosophy of Jesus Christ. At least on such a scale, even now there could be very small, isolated um, societies which still maintain the true teachings of Jesus Christ, but those, they will be always small. If, if they're too big, they would have been killed already. And despite the well-wishing philosophy of certain New Age groups who preach that uh, don't pay attention to karma, you just, uh, it will change as you go. Well, apparently it doesn't. There are cases clearly proving not only karma, but also ancestral karma. So what Vanga said about the payment of the sin of uh, killing Pope Bogomil is fully plausible. And that is why I beg all of you to never vote again for politicians who finance military groups of the type kill them all and God will sort them out. In each and every country there is a political party, political movement who is against this type of activities. It's just a question of inquiring and finding out who are they exactly. It is the bribed media who has convinced most people that all politicians must be corrupt and there is no other way. This is simply not true. Leaders of pure spirit and honor will be always there. That is for sure. But what is not sure is if the sheeple will care to recognize them or they will decide to walk the path of negativity, always see themselves as innocent, helpless victims who will spend their lives in depressive state of consciousness, die in desperation just to get born again in the same circumstances, again and again, until finally they don't get courageous and knowledgeable enough to start modeling their reality with the power of their thoughts and intentions. Mm -hmm.